call the state of Wisconsin versus uh, Todd Kenthammer, 16 CF 909. Appearances? State appears by Tim Drinken and Susan Domsky. Uh, Mr. Ken Hammer appears in person and by counsel Jonas Benerick and Stephen Hurley with paralegal Siobhan Cagle. All right, either side have anything they want to put on the record before we begin? Yes, Your Honor. Um, just want to raise to the court's attention that this morning one of the jurors came very early. I was sitting in the hallway and as I was walking through, he said good morning to me and I, I didn't respond, given the court's directives, and if it could be communicated to the jury that they should not engage us in any way and if we don't we're not being rude or standoffish we're just not allowed to respond and he clearly right. indicated he had a similar experience in the parking ramp a juror had ran into and said good morning to him and he also did not respond but we don't have anything that we're I'll, um remind them that they need to be rude to all of you <laughs> <laughs> all right um anything else from you mr hurley or mr Bernard? no sir all right i did excuse one juror we're down to 14 now uh, juror number 3292, I don't know if he's the one that was here early, um, just came in and told uh, the clerk of court he's ill, doesn't want to get everyone ill, and um, I said then I'll excuse him. It's Gerald 3292, the one with the cane. I don't know if that's the one that said good morning. Yes, it was. Then you don't have to worry about him then. So uh, he'll be excused because of that, so we'll be down to 14, two alternates, so... Um, I did remove one of the chairs this morning. All right, anything else from either side? Um, Your Honor, as far as timing, my first witness will be very, very brief, just a couple minutes, and then we'll have Dr. McCubbin, who will be quite lengthy. All right, uh, you anticipate her to be done before uh, the lunch break by both sides? I would think so. Why did you select Laquan right. Barrow? Uh, on the menu for today, they want us to be uh, pretty precise on when we decide we should take lunch, so if I have a, what, a half hour notice at least? No, because it's a long So you want the jury to be happy, so try to give me a good heads up on that. All right, if um, nothing else, then you can bring the jury in if they're ready. The state calls Dr. Kathleen McCubbin. Good morning. Can you please state your name for the record? My name is Dr. Kathleen McCubbin, MC, capital C, U, B as in boy, B as in boy, I, N as in Nancy. And what is your occupation? I am a forensic pathologist or medical examiner. Where do you currently work? I currently work at the Orange County Medical Examiner's Office in Orange County, New York. Where did you work in September of 2016? At that time, I worked at the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office based in Madison, Wisconsin. And how long have you worked as a forensic pathologist? I've worked as a forensic pathologist since July of 2010, so about seven and a half years. Could you briefly describe to us what the job of a forensic pathologist is? Sure. So I'll start by explaining pathology in general. And pathology is the study of disease in the human body. Now, forensic pathology is a subspecialty of pathology where forensic pathologists study injury or disease in the human body, they interpret injury patterns, and they determine cause and sometimes manner of death. And they do this by performing autopsies, looking at investigative material, and ultimately putting everything together to determine the cause and manner of death. Can you describe the education that you have? Sure. So I attended the University of Wisconsin and received my uh, bachelor's of science degrees in molecular biology and the history of science. I then attended the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and received my medical degree. <coughs> Following that, I did a four-year residency in anatomic and clinical pathology at the University of Vermont in Burlington, Vermont. 
After that, I went to New York City and I completed a one-year subspecialty fellowship in forensic pathology at the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. After that, I did an additional year of forensic neuropathology and cardiovascular pathology, which is the study of disease and injury in the brain and in the heart. Following that, I stayed on as a city medical examiner in the city um, for about six years, working in Brooklyn and Manhattan. At that point, I came to the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office and worked there for approximately a year and then went to the Orange County Medical Examiner's Office, where I am a deputy medical examiner. Are you familiar with the term board certified? Yes, I am. Could you explain that to us? Board certification simply means that after going through your training and performing a certain number of examinations or autopsies, you then are eligible to sit for a comprehensive examination. And if you pass that examination, you are considered to be board certified. And are you board certified? Yes, I am board certified in anatomic and clinical pathology, as well as forensic pathology. What states are you licensed in? I am licensed in the states of New York and Wisconsin. In what disciplines? Um, in medicine and surgery. The, if it pleases the court, um, we have previously agreed to admit exhibits, exhibits 59 through 74. 59 and 74 or through, through 74. 74? That's correct. Sir. All right. Uh, this is a copy of my curriculum vita, basically my resume going over my education and experience. And does it accurately reflect um, what we just went over today? It does. I believe that this copy does not update uh, my more recent uh, position at the Orange County Medical Examiner's Office. Other than that, it's current? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. And you talked a little bit earlier that you, about performing autopsy, autopsies. Do you perform them as part of your routine duties? Yes, I do. And what other duties um, do you have or what encompasses an autopsy? So an autopsy is a medical procedure where I first start with an external examination of the body, looking over the body for body characteristics. I then also look for any external evidence of natural disease or injury. At that point in time, we also take photographs, draw specimens for toxicology testing, and then I proceed with the internal portion of the autopsy exam. And that is a series of surgical-like incisions for me to examine all of the internal organs of the body, looking for further evidence of any disease or injury. Thank you. In doing your duties, do you determine cause of death? Yes, I do. Can you explain what that means? So the cause of death is the underlying etiology, either an injury or a disease, that sets the process of death into motion. So it could be something, for instance, a gunshot wound, or it could be something like heart disease that ends up causing someone's death. And you do forensic autopsies. About how many of those have you done in your career? I have personally performed almost 1,500 autopsies, and I've assisted or observed in about two to three times as many. Directing your attention uh, back to September of 2016, on September 20th, did you perform an autopsy on the body of a woman identified as Barbara Kent Handler? Yes, I did. Were there photographs taken at the autopsy? Yes, there were. And did you detail a report of your findings? Yes, I did. In addition to performing the autopsy, did you review anything else related to Barbara Kenhammer's death? Yes, I did. And what was that? I reviewed a brief, it was a couple page report on the specifics of the accident provided to me. Um, I reviewed some medical records. Um, I reviewed some photographs of the car at the scene. Um, and ultimately, before I released my report, I did review the entirety of her medical records. Um, photographs of the scene, photographs of Mr. Ken Hammer, and photographs of the pipe. And when you say you reviewed medical records, um, with, what medical records did you review specifically? 
I reviewed the medical records that were generated at Gunderson Lutheran Medical Center. Related to this accident or this incident? Correct, related to the admission after the incident. Showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 6. Do you recognize this? I believe so. Yes, I do. Also, did you want me to receive all these uh, documents at this point or as you introduce them or what was your intent? We, we've agreed they may be received. Yeah. Right, just for the record, because I haven't done it yet, uh, 59 through <coughs> 74 will all be received then. And we'll go from there. So, carry on. I gave you that copy of the autopsy report because you'll be referencing it during the rest of your testimony, <coughs> I presume. Yes. Um, when you completed the autopsy, did you have an opinion as to the cause of Barbara Kenhammer's death? Yes, I did. And what was that? The cause of Barbara Kenhammer's death was blunt impact injuries of her head and neck. We're going to go over some charts now. <coughs> we had the easel set up here. Do you not? You can put that where you want. I just okay. wanted to move for the witnesses okay. walking around. For the record, this is Exhibit 7. Can all the jurors see that? Okay. Can you tell us Your what? Honor, may I stand over here? Uh, yeah, you can stand where you would like. Can you tell us what this chart depicts? And feel free to reference your report if you need to. Sure. This is a body diagram, and basically all of the marks that I've put on that body diagram indicate injuries that I've documented on the body. Starting in the torso area, can you tell us what injuries you documented? Would it be okay if I approach the and we point? Have you have or do you prefer? Use the microphone so if the pointer will work, that would be good. Okay, thank you. And if you need that angle just a little more toward yourself, um, you can have her reposition it. Yes, please, if you could angle it just slightly. And can the jury still see that? Judge, I'm having difficulty seeing the witness at this point. <laughs> you want to bring it closer toward me, perhaps, and then you can watch the witness. Maybe just a... That's good for me. Does that work for you? We'll make it work. If you want it moved a little more, we'll just... Okay, all right. Go ahead. So can you describe the injuries you observed in Barbara Kenhammer's torso area? Sure. So on this diagram, first off, you can see there's a little mark across the left side of the neck there. And there I observed a three by one half inch area of contusion. A contusion is a bruise or a blunt impact injury. Then you see these sort of marks that I've made across the front of the top part of the chest over the clavicles. So that is a 10 by 3 inch area of red, purple, bruising, and bleeding into the skin. Overlying the area of the left upper chest, there was a 1 and 1 quarter by 1 half inch area of abrasion that was sort of U-shaped. And an abrasion is another type of blunt impact injury. It's a scrape on the skin. As far as the torso goes, on the back of the, of the top of the midline back, there was an area of bleeding in the fatty tissues beneath the skin that measured one and three quarters inch by one and one half inch. Then on the right lower back or the top of the buttock region, there was another bruise or contusion that measured one and one half by three quarters inches. And then on the left lower back, there was a three-quarter inch purple bruise or contusion. There was also a pink contusion of the right groin that measured one and one-half inches. 
So those are, I believe, all the injuries of the torso on this diagram. There are other injuries of the extremities, though. Sure, let's talk about them. What um, injuries did you observe on the arms? So on the arms, on the right upper arm, on the inner surface, there was a three-inch area, uh, which was a cluster of multiple red-purple contusions or bruises. On the inside of the left arm, there was a four by two and one half inch area of patchy bruising that was red and purple. On the back side of the right upper arm, there was a one quarter inch purple bruise. On the kind of inner part of the right elbow, there was a one half inch very faint purple bruise. And then on the left forearm, on the side in line with the pinky finger, or the ulnar side, there was a three inch faint pink bruise. Now moving to the lower extremities, on the right lateral thigh, there was a one and one half inch contusion or bruise. On the front portion of the mid part of the thigh, there was a one half inch bruise. Then slightly below that, there was a one and one half inch area of patchy red purple bruising or contusion. And slightly below that, there was another area, two and one quarter inch of red purple bruising or contusion. Further down on the right shin, there was a two and one half by one inch area of tannish colored contusion that had an overlying scrape or abrasion that measured one quarter inch. Now on the front part of the left leg, there was a 7 8 inch contusion or bruise kind of on the lateral aspect to the side. And then further down towards the ankle, there was a 3 and 1 quarter inch area of red pink contusion. On the back side of the legs, on the left calf, there was a 5 inch area of red purple contusion. And then on the right calf, there were two bruises. One was one and one half inches, and one was one and one quarter inches. Thank you. I'm going to show you now a hand chart. <laughs> this has been marked as exhibit. Just to clarify that, you're saying that these charts are you pre-authorized? Correct. That is correct. Right? And what numbers? Do you have them? Six, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, you want me to receive all those then at this time? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So if it's six, seven, eight, and nine will be received. Go ahead. So this hand chart, um, can you tell us what this is? So this is another diagram that I use um, that shows the hands, the right and the left, both the front and the back, and any documentation on there is where I documented injuries on the hands. Starting with the right hand, can you go through the injuries that you found on Mrs. Kenhammer's right hand? Sure. So on the right hand, on the back of the hand near the wrist, there was a one quarter inch linear abrasion, and then slightly further towards the fingertips, there was a one quarter inch faint blue bruise or contusion. On the back of the right ring finger, there were two small red abrasions. Now on the back of the right index finger, there were also two small punctate abrasions. Closer towards the back of the hand, there was a one and one quarter inch area of multiple red and brown linear or line-like healing abrasions. On the left hand, there was an area of purple contusion on the back of the left thumb, and there was an overlying area of abrasion on the back of the left thumb. Then there was a two and one half inch area of contusion and bleeding into the skin on the back of the left hand and on the region of the left fifth finger or pinky finger. 
And when you flip the hand over, that area of bleeding and contusion extended onto the palm of the left hand as well. Thank you. Now I'm going to put up the head injury chart. This is Exhibit 8. So starting with this diagram in the upper left, can you tell me what you noted that you found in the autopsy of Barbara Kenhammer on her head or face area? Sure. So starting on the upper left diagram, the front of the face and neck, we can see that there was a one-inch bruise or contusion sort of of the left upper forehead region. Then there was a one inch laceration, which is another blunt impact injury. It's a tear in the skin. And that had been sutured at the hospital. And that was on the middle part of her forehead. Then there was a one quarter inch pink purple bruise or contusion that was sort of between the eyebrows. Now around both eyes, there was what we call red purple periorbital ecchymosis which is bleeding that can collect around the eyes. And you tend to see that sometimes when you have injuries, for instance, of the nose or forehead, and the blood seeps around the eyes, giving you that raccoon eye appearance. When I examined her nose, I could feel that there were palpable fractures in the nasal bones. On the left temple, I noted that there was a one quarter inch abrasion or scrape. Then moving down to the front part of the neck, there was a three by two inch area of multiple small linear and curvilinear abrasions or scrapes on the skin of the neck. And these were oriented in different directions and some of them were, were roughly parallel in their orientation. And those had sort of a tannish appearance to them uh, from some elements of healing. And when I washed the body after the initial examination, it showed a kind of pink abraded base to the injuries. Um, marked up here, because I couldn't really draw it on the inside of the lips, there was an area of contusion, purple contusion or bruising on the inside of the upper lip that measured one and one half inches. And then on the inside of the lower lip as well, measuring one and one quarter inch. Moving to this portion of the diagram, showing the back of the head, it can show that there were three lacerations on the back of the head, or what we call the occiput, kind of the back lower portion of the head. There was one on the left side that was three-quarter inch, and then there were two on the right side that were right next to each other. And when I shaved the hair around this area of injuries, you could see that there was a three uh, I think it was three and three quarter inch area of red abrasion sort of encompassing that whole region around those lacerations. Now when you say laceration, um, can you describe to me what that means in medical terms? So a laceration is a tear in the skin that's due to a blunt impact injury. So when something causes you know, intense pressure on the skin and it crushes it and causes the skin to tear as opposed to a sharp injury, which would be like a bladed object or something very sharp. Now moving down to the lower portions. Can we go back to the, the lacerations on the top of the head? Um, I believe you said they were full thickness tears. Can you tell me what that means? Full thickness tears. Sure. Full thickness just means that the laceration went all the way down to the, to the skull underline. Um, sometimes you can have partial thickness lacerations, which only tear the super, superficial levels of the skin, but this tore all the way through the skin. And did you notice anything underneath those lacerations related to the skull? Yes. So there was, first off, there was some bleeding in the tissues underlying those lacerations. And then in the region of this left, la left occipital laceration, there was a skull fracture. And this was, there were multiple fracture lines 
that coursed from the back left side of the skull through the base of the skull or the lower portion of the skull towards the middle lower portion of the skull in a bone called the sphenoid bone. Now let's go to the bottom diagrams. If you could explain I think, those. I'm sorry, I think I neglected to mention this injury right here. On the left back of the neck, there was a 3 8 inch pink-red contusion as well. Moving down to the sides of the face, on the right side of the face, I could see that there was a 2 inch area of bleeding in the skin that had collected to the side of the right side of the eye. And then on the right cheek, there was a two inch cluster of multiple linear brown healing abrasions. And these abrasions, as you can see sort of from my drawing there, they went in different directions. Uh, some of them aligned potentially with a endotracheal uh, strap that was placed in the hospital, but others were in different directions that wouldn't align with that strap. On the right side below the right earlobe, there was a 3 8 inch blue bruise or contusion. On the right chin, sort of at the angle of the jaw, there was a red purple bruise or contusion extending from the chin onto the jawline and to the lateral neck. Then moving to the left side, there was a similar area of red purple contusion or ecchymosis lateral to the left eye. And then there was an additional area of linear healing brown abrasions on the left cheek. And again, these were multiple linear abrasions that coursed in different directions. And in that region, there was also an overlying one quarter inch blue contusion. Now, not listed on this diagram, but listed below in free text there was my examination of the tongue, which showed that there was a hemorrhage on the right lateral side of the tongue, and then another hemorrhage on the left lateral side of the tongue. So the sides of the tongue on both the right and left. Thank you. Now I'm gonna be putting up a chart that's labeled the therapeutic procedures. Can you tell us what this chart is, chart is depicting? So this is simply another body diagram chart, but on this chart I documented evidence of medical intervention um, and also evidence of uh, post-mortem donation of tissues and also organ donation. So if I'm understanding you correct, these are injuries that might have occurred in life-saving measures or through organ donation. They're not all injuries. Some of them are injuries related to, you know, medical therapy, but others are just evidence of surgical incisions, for instance, things like that. And did you note any of these injuries on the previous charts that we looked at? No, those charts, those were separately noted. The injuries that I felt were true injuries were separately noted on the previous charts, and this was a chart to document all the evidence of medical intervention. Now let's take a look a little closer at some of the injuries.
So we're going to start with the lip area, um, showing you what's previously been marked as Exhibit 62. Can you describe this photo to us? Sure. So this is a photograph of Mrs. Ken Hammer's face and specifically a close-up on her lower lip. Her eyes would be right up here and you can see some of that hemorrhaging around the eyes that's on the corner of the photo. This is just a, a ruler and a label with the case number from the case. And then this is showing the inside surface of the lower lip. And you can see this large area of hemorrhaging or bruising of the tissues of the lower lip. And what's previously been marked as Exhibit 63, can you describe that to us? Sure. This is, a, again, a similar picture, only this time we're focusing on the upper lip. And you can see this large area of purple, red bruising or contusion on the inside surface of the upper lip. Other things you can note in here, again, is you see the hemorrhaging around the eyes, and then there is uh, that uh, abraded contusion kind of between the brows there as well. Looking at the injuries uh, to Barbara's mouth and lips, were there any injuries that you noted on the outside of her lips? There were no significant external injuries. The injuries were really on the inside of the lips. Were her teeth damaged at all? I did not see any evidence of injury or fracture to the teeth, no. Did you see any injuries to the lips that had a curved or linear pattern like would be you'd find at the end of a pipe? No, I did not. Could these injuries be ca caused from flailing? Well, these injuries are blunt impact injuries. So what that means is that a blunt object either struck the mouth or the mouth hit into a, struck, a, a blunt object. Um, I can't tell you definitively how that happened. Theoretically, it could be possible from failing, how, from failing to strike your face into a blunt object, but I would think it would be, have to be pretty forceful to generate this amount of bruising on the inside of the lips. Now showing you what's been previously marked as Exhibit 64. Can you tell us what's depicted in that photo? Sure. So this is a photograph. Um, this is actually after autopsy was complete. Um, we can see that there is a bruise on the right jawline. Um, and it's extending onto the right neck. So we see that red-purple bruising there. Um, you can faintly see some abrasions on the neck. Um, and some abrasions down here, but I think you'll see them better in a different photograph. Can you tell us what causes a contusion? Again, a contusion, much like an abrasion or a laceration, they're all different forms of blunt impact injuries. So when something either strikes the skin or the skin is pushed up against a blunt surface, it causes damage to the blood vessels in the skin, and that causes blood cells to leak out and give that appearance of hemorrhaging into the skin. Thank you. Showing you what's previously marked as Exhibit 65. Can you tell us what this photo is? This is a photograph of Mrs. Ken Hammer's forehead. And you can see her eyebrows right here. We can see this abraded contusion between the brows there. And then this is the sutured laceration that was on the mid part of her forehead. Did you put those sutures in? I did not, no. Did you at any point take the sutures out? I did. And why did you do that? I took the sutures out to see the margins of the wound better, because um, when it's sutured together, I can't really see it too well, and to see how far the laceration went. And it was a full thickness laceration of the skin of the forehead. And what would cause this type of injury? This again would be a blunt impact injury, either something striking the head or the head striking something. Moving on to what's previously been marked as Exhibit 66, can you again tell us what's depicted in this photo? So this is a photograph of the left side of Mrs. Ken Hammer's temple and forehead. Um, and we can see again there's some of that hemorrhaging around the eyes. We see there's an abrasion right there uh, on the left forehead. And actually, on these additional photos, it seems there's a little more bleeding around the skin as well. And then right up here is that contusion of the left forehead. It's a little 
dark from the shadow of the ruler, but it's right there. When we had the chart up, you referenced the eyes and the raccooning. Can you tell us, again, some causes that would cause the blood pooling around the eyes? Sure. So when you have injuries either to the forehead or to the midline nasal area, that can cause hemorrhaging into the tissues around it. And then depending on the type of tissue and how much blood is there, the blood will kind of gravitationally fall into more dependent areas. Around the eyes, the skin is actually kind of a looser tissue beneath the skin. And so the blood tends to collect around the eyes and sit there and it can drain from the forehead or from the nasal region and be around the eyes then. You also noted an abrasion in between the eyes on her nose, I believe, in the charts. Yes, there was on one of the previous photos, there was that abraded contusion kind of in between the brow region, yes. Okay. And so you've said that you found uh, palpable nasal uh, fractures. How much force does it take to break someone's nose? I cannot give you a definitive number for that. It, it varies on the individual and how they're falling and things like that, but it does take some force to cause a fracture, obviously. And did you see anything in the nasal area or in the forehead that would resemble uh, Mrs. Kenhammer being struck by a pipe? I did not see anything with a curvilinear pattern to suggest that the end of a pipe struck her forehead or nose, no. I'm going to go back a minute to these lip photos. Um, you said that it was a blunt force trauma. Could that also be, could pressure to those lips cause those injuries? Yes, if you had intense pressure over the lips, um, pushing the lips against the teeth, for instance, um, that is in itself a form of blunt force trauma, yes. So could you give an example of pushing the lips over the teeth, what would that mean to you? For instance, if someone had either, you know, a quick push would be, for instance, a blow to the mouth, such as a punch or something like that. But a more prolonged pressure, such as someone holding their hand against the mouth and pushing against the teeth and mouth could cause this injury to the lips as well. Moving now to what's been previously marked as Exhibit 67, can you tell us uh, what this picture depicts? This is a close-up of Mrs. Ken Hammer's right cheek. So I described there was this cluster of multiple linear brown healing abrasions. And you can see some of them are coursing this way, some of them are coursing this way. We have one up here, several over here, more towards the side. And so these are blunt trauma injuries and abrasions are scraping against the skin. In this photo, which has been marked as Exhibit 68, can you describe this? This is the left side of Mrs. Ken Hammer's cheek. And similarly here, we have multiple healing linear brown abrasions going in different directions. Some of them are coursing more vertical, vertically. Some are more horizontally. And then it's sort of faint, but there is a small bruise in this area as well, kind of a pinkish blue bruise. You said when we were looking at the charts that you attributed some of these abrasions to some therapeutic interventions, um, but not all. Is that correct? I said it's possible that some of them could be related to therapeutic interventions, yes. Is it also possible that coarse grass or vegetation would cause that type of injury if someone's face was in it? If someone's face was being pushed into something that had that pattern, it could possibly cause this injury pattern as well, yes. showing you what's previously been marked as Exhibit 69. Can you tell me what's depicted in this photo? This is a picture of the back of Mrs. Ken Hammer's head. And these, these are the three lacerations that I described earlier. So she's, the top of her head is in this direction and her neck is down here. So this is the left back side of the head and there was a three quarter inch laceration there. And then on the right side, it's a little difficult to see here, but there's two lacerations right next to each other. What would cause these type of lacerations? And these are blunt impact injuries, so they could be caused by something striking the head 
Alternatively, they could be caused by the head being falling or striking or pushing into something as well that's blunt and firm. About how many impacts do you think would have caused these three lacerations? I think it's likely that there are at least two, if not three, impacts here. Because this site is somewhat separate from these two clustered, I can't say definitively if this represented one you know, injury against an uneven object, but I do feel there are at least likely two injuries or two impacts here. Will the end of a pipe traveling with force cause all of these lacerations? Well, I'll sustain the objection the way it's phrased. Are you familiar, when you did your autopsy, you said you reviewed the accident report. There was a brief uh, two-page document, I believe, yes. And um, so you're familiar with the, uh, the facts as they were given by Mr. Kandammer? Yes. And was there anything about these injuries that concerned you related to the version of events told by Mr. Kandammer? Object to the formal question. Sustained ask, uh, no, just sustained. Was there anything concerning about these injuries to you? Object to the formal question. Sustained. When you looked at these injuries, do you think they came from a pipe? I do not believe that these injuries are consistent with the end of a pipe striking the back of the head, no. And why do you have that opinion? because I don't see any evidence of a curvilinear mark from the end of a pipe. I also think that if a pipe was traveling with great force and struck the back of the head, it, if you're gonna say that this were all from the pipe, then it would have to be traveling sort of tangentially across the back of the head, and I believe that in that situation, it would actually avulse the tissue because the intense energy uh, of the pipe traveling at that speed into the back of the head would cause worse damage than just these few lacerations. What do you mean by evulse the tissue? Meaning that it would quite likely tear the tissue off the scalp as opposed to cause three separate lacerations. And can you also speak to the skull fractures that we previously described as it relates to this photo? Where, where did you find the skull fractures? Sure. So. Again, this is the top of the head, this is the neck. So the fracture was underlying this region, this laceration right here, and it traveled along the base of the skull, or the bottom part of the skull. Showing you what's previously been marked as Exhibit 70. Can you tell me what's depicted in this photo? So this is a photo that was taken while Mrs. Kent Hammer was still in the hospital. And this is a photograph that shows multiple linear, curvilinear, and irregular abrasions over the neck. And it's sort of on the front part of the neck, and it does extend up sort of onto the underside of the chin almost, right where the neck creases would be. And you can see that they are, many of them are linear, and they're coursing in different directions. And some of them have a sort of parallel ray. And these are abrasions or scrapes against the skin. Could have this been caused by an object with a sharp edge? Yes, well, abrasions, when you're having linear scrapes against the skin, they are usually caused by something that has a sharp margin being dragged across the skin. When I say sharp, it don't mean necessarily a blade or anything like that, but something that has a linear sharp margin. Would these be injuries you suspect of a stab wound? No. Are these injuries? that to you, that you would expect with the type, end of a pipe scratching her? I do not see any evidence of a curvilinear area of abrasion, a, a, a significant large curvilinear. There's small, little linear and curvilinear abrasions that have some slight curve to them, but nothing that I would deem to be consistent with the end of a pipe, no. Could these be from fingernails? Yes, possibly. You also talked earlier about a contusion on the left posterior neck. And I don't see it clearly depicted in this photo, but I want to talk about it a minute. Um, 
could you describe showing this photo that that contusion just with your pointer where it was it's sort of impossible to show on this photo because it is on this is really the front of the neck okay um, so it would be on the back of the neck and it was on the left side so back the portion of her neck that's against the bedding or pillow back on this side is where that contusion was that contusion that you noted would that be consistent with a seatbelt injury for a no. passenger no, that would not be consistent with a seatbelt injury. You also noted that Mrs. Kentammer had a cricoid fracture? Yes. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. So in the neck, underlying the skin and the fatty tissues, there is a complicated structure that takes air down to the lungs and then also takes uh, your food and your liquids down to your gastrointestinal system. So in the top part of the neck, you have sort of the tongue and the oropharynx, and then you have a bone called the hyoid bone, which is a horseshoe-shaped bone in the top of the neck. Beneath that, you have the thyroid cartilage, and for instance, in a man that's sort of prominent, we call it the Adam's apple. Just below that thyroid cartilage is the cricoid cartilage, and it's a cartilaginous ring that's at the top of the trachea and then the trachea takes your air down to your lungs. So that cartilaginous ring, the cricoid cartilage, was fractured, and there were multiple fracture portions on the front of the ring. What causes cricoid fractures? Cricoid fractures can be seen in either compression of neck, such as manual strangulation, where there's intense pressure on the cricoid. They can be seen in blunt impact injuries. Uh, they can be seen when you have a strike or a chop to the neck or you have an impact of the neck against a hard surface. Could a seatbelt cause a cricoid cartilage fracture? It is possible that a seatbelt could cause a cricoid cartilage fracture in certain situations. Did you think that was the case in this instance? I did not think so, no. And why not? Why not? So when I see the cricoid cartilage fracture with the hemorrhage around it, as well as that pattern of multiple irregular lacerate, or excuse me, multiple linear and irregular abrasions on the neck, and I did not see any evidence of what we call a seatbelt sign, which is a abrasion or contusion on the side of the neck where the seatbelt would be. When you put all of these things together, the findings on the skin surface on the neck as well as the injuries of the cricoid cartilage and the bleeding around it, and the totality of all the injuries that I saw, I did not feel that this injury was consistent with a seatbelt injury. Could someone holding a cup with their head snapping down cause this type of injury? If you... I want more clarification on that hypothesis, I guess, or that scenario. When someone's head goes down, would you expect their cricoid cartilage to fracture? If you somehow had a very forceful downward snap of the neck and the cup was held in an area where a firm edge hit that area, it's possible, but then you wouldn't, the cup would have to be held downwards and you wouldn't expect injuries elsewhere. Showing you what's previously been marked as Exhibit 71. Can you tell us what this picture is depicting? Sure. So this is a picture of Mrs. Ken Hammer's right hand, and you can see uh, her nails. They're a bit dirty um, as far as there's some brownish material under the nails. And then on the right ring finger, there is an irregular margin where it looks like there has been tearing or ripping of the margin of the nail. The brown underneath the nails. Could that be staining? It's some sort of accumulation or of something brown under the nails or potentially, yes, something brown could stain the nails, but I think it's more accumulation of brown material under the nail. Showing you what's previously been marked as Exhibit 72, can you tell us what this photo shows? Sure. So this is the right hand again, and on the 
ring finger, we can see that there's two small healing abrasions on the back side and kind of the side portion of the ring finger. Do they appear to be fresh injuries? Well, they appear to be healing, but the, they do appear to be recent in that they haven't completely healed or formed a new scar base or anything like that. I can't tell you exactly when they occurred, um, but they do appear to be in relatively recent. What's previously been marked as Exhibit 73 is being shown. Can you tell us what that is? This is just a close-up on the right ring finger nail to show that torn irregular margin. Was a clipping taken from this finger for purposes of DNA analysis? Yes, fingernail clippings were taken from all the nails. And I'm now showing you what's previously been marked as Exhibit 74. Can you tell us what this photograph shows? This is a photograph of Mrs. Ken Hammer's uh, left hand. And you can see this area of contusion and bruising on the left uh, fifth finger or pinky finger and also extending onto the side and back of the left hand. Is this the type of bruise that you would expect from IV placement or any therapeutic type interventions? No, it is not. And why not? It's not in an appropriate location for IV placement and extending onto the fingers. And also this bruise extends onto the palm or surface as well, or the palm of the hand, and that is not expected for uh, IV placement and things like that. When you completed your autopsy of Barbara Kenhammer, did you see any injuries or evidence in the autopsy of a pipe impaling Barbara Kenhammer? No, I did not. And are the opinions you gave today given with a, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes, they are. No further questions. Uh, do you want to take a break right now? It's going to be a while. It's going to be a while. Yeah, why don't we take a break then before you start your uh, questioning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll have you step out. Uh, don't talk about the case. We'll take a uh, 10 to 15 minute break and um, have you back here shortly. All right, uh, the record could show we're back in the courtroom outside the presence of the jury. I'd like to remember people to use the microphone when you're talking. I see that the defense microphone is not anywhere near uh, counsel, so when you make your objections, they're very hard to hear. So fix the microphone and use it. Let me just say, Judge, we, we got a telephone call last night from someone who knew us who said, who was watching the, the streaming of this, who said that uh, they were able to hear what we were saying to one another, what the prosecution was saying to one no, another. No, that's fine. You can take that into account. I don't need to have anyone hear that, but when you talk to be on the record, it needs to be heard. So use the microphone at least at that point, okay? Sure. And from your opening yesterday, when you stood to the side, you know, even I could hardly hear you. So uh, just keep that in mind, okay? Okay. Anything we need to put on the record other than all that before we bring the jury in? No, sir. If they're ready, bring them in. <coughs> all right, Mr. Hurley, you ready? Yes, sir. I right, may proceed with your cross-examination. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. You received your BS in molecular biology and the history of science in 2002, is that correct? Yes, I believe so. And then UW School of Medicine graduated in 2006? Yes, sir. And thereafter did a residency uh, from 2006 to 2010 in anatomic and clinical pathology, correct? Correct. And that you did at University of Vermont, is that correct? Yes, sir. And the residency is part of the educational process, is that correct? Yes. What is the difference between anatomical pathology and clinical pathology? So anatomic pathology is where you're looking at the tissues of the body to make your diagnosis. So for instance, you may be doing autopsies, or you may be a, a pathologist in a hospital who's reading biopsies or looking at surgical specimens. 
clinical pathology is based on looking at diagnoses made in the medical laboratory, looking at blood specimens, for instance, or other body fluid specimens, microbiology, chemistry, things like that. Subsequent to your residency in anatomic and clinical pathology, you did a fellowship in forensic pathology, is that correct? Yes, sir. And a fellowship is also part of the educational process, is that Am yes, right? it's, it's advanced uh, educational yes. training, yes. And then you did a second fellowship uh, also at the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Forensic Neuropathology and Cardiovascular Pathology. Yes, sir. And that you finished in 2012. Uh, yes. Just briefly, what is the difference between neuropathology and cardiovascular, cardiovascular pathology? So neuropathology is looking at pathology of the brain. So earlier when I said pathology is the study of either disease or injury in the body, if you narrow that down to neuropathology, it's looking at disease or injury in the brain. And the central nervous system, I should say as well, including the spinal cord and the brain stem. And cardiovascular pathology? So that similarly, that would be focused on the heart. Fellowships are, not every physician does a fellowship, is that correct? Correct. And one is, one, one applies for a fellowship, but one who applies, even if they're really smart, doesn't always get the fellowship, is that correct? Correct. So you're getting not just one, but two fellowships is an accomplishment. I would agree, yes. And. Having finished that education in 2012, I, I want to talk briefly, and I, I mean no disrespect by this, about what you haven't been trained in. Not trained in engineering, correct? Correct. Not trained in physics, correct? Other than physics as part of college, yes. Right. No training in biomechanics? No specific training. No training in accident reconstruction, correct? No, sir. And. I believe in, in your experience, uh, there's only been one instance where you've encountered uh, a, a death involving something coming through the windshield of the car, is that correct? Yes, I actually, after a preliminary hearing, went back through my case logs, and it wasn't actually my case, it was my colleagues, but I was involved with it at the time. And that's the only time you were involved in a case other than this one with an, uh, a purported object coming through an, a, a windscreen of a car, correct? Yes, sir. I want to talk about what you had at hand when you performed the autopsy, okay? You were, said you were given a, a couple or a few page report of the occurrence. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. What can you tell me about that report? As I recall, I haven't reviewed this report recently at all, but as I recall, it was a brief document that just stated uh, that, you know, Mr. Ken Hemmer had given the statement that they had been driving down the road and that a pipe had come off and gone through the windshield and that um, they were found with the car sort of slightly off the road into the ditch and that she was taken to the hospital and her injuries were treated there. I don't recall any significant more specifics about, you know, accident reconstruction. There certainly wasn't anything like that in that report. At the time you did the autopsy, a police officer named Yaley was present, is that correct? Not during the initial autopsy, no. Not during the autopsy. Did you meet Officer Yaley on the date of the autopsy? Not on the date of the autopsy, it was the following day when I re-examined the body and had Officer Yaley there during that time. And did he impart any information to you about the occurrence? He had brought the pipe with him, although we did not unwrap it. I just looked at photographs of the pipe um, that he, he brought that day. Um, he had also brought uh, pictures of Mr. Ken Hammer, uh, I guess shortly after the accident. Um, and as far as other specifics of like accident reconstruction, no, it wasn't discussed that day. You given any information about uh, the speed at which the Ken Hammer car was traveling? I don't believe so. 
given any information about uh, a purported speed at which a pipe was traveling? No. Uh, were you told about who was belted in and who wasn't belted in in the, in the automobile? Yes, I believe if I wasn't told that, I asked that. So I learned that she was belted is what I was told. Were you shown any photographs of the automobile? Yes, I actually had some, some photographs the day of autopsy were provided on CD. And can you recall what those, auto, what those photographs depicted? Yes. Will you tell the jury which photographs you saw? I recall seeing pictures of the car taken from more of a distance uh, from towards the, the front of the car, showing the fractures or the, the defects in the, in the windshield. Um, I remember seeing some photographs of the inside, like passenger seat area, the front passenger and driver seat area, um, so showing some broken glass around the interior compartment. Um, and there, there were a handful of pictures from the scene. I, those are the two that stand out in my mind. Um, you know, there was a number, like further back, closer up pictures, things like that. Did Officer Yaley impart any information other than what was in the report that you read and the photographs of the automobile? Well, I believe he clarified that she was belted. I don't believe that I knew that the day before. I, I, I can't, honestly can't recall off the top of my head. Um, and he brought the information, the pictures of the pipe, which, um, and then the pictures of Mr. Kent Hammer, which I hadn't had prior. So th that information was relayed to me. Okay. Any, anything else uh, that the police provided to you? Not that I can recall, no. You said you had the medical records from the hospital, is that correct? Yes, I initially had a small segment of medical records, just uh, I, I don't recall exactly how many pages, and then at a later point I asked for all of the medical records from the hospital be, to be provided to me. Did you have the medical records from the emergency medical technicians? Eventually I did, but I don't believe I had them initially. Did you have them prior to writing your report? Yes. Now, the accident occurred on September 16. On what date did you perform your examination? So the autopsy was performed on September 20th. And then the following day, I did a re-examination with more photography of the body and to go over findings with Officer Yaley. So it would have been about five days or so well, if we count the 16th, because it was in the morning, five days after the occurrence. The, the main autopsy would have been four days, but then the re-examination, I guess, would be the fifth day, the 16th to the 20th. Okay. Depending on how you count your day, I guess. Were you given any information about how Mr. Ken Hammer had extracted his, his wife from the vehicle? Um, no specifics, no. I was told that he removed her from the vehicle, but not specifically how. So you weren't told, for example, that uh, he had difficulty in removing her from the vehicle, and in, in part because of the incline, and in part because of the position of her body and her movement, and that he struggled to get her out of the vehicle. I was not told that initially, no. Were you told that he finally had to yank her out of the vehicle? No, I was not. Were you told that after he extracted her from the vehicle, they fell backwards with her on top of him? I don't think that specifically was told to me, no. Were you told that while he was on the phone with emergency medical services, he repositioned the body so that her head was, was uphill rather than downhill? At some point in time, I was told that, I believe, but I don't recall exactly when in the process I was told that. Were you told that subsequent to that, both he and the emergency medical technician had to move her body some five feet up to the road? I was told that, yes. Were you told how they moved it up? Um, I believe at some point I was told that they had grabbed, I think, under her belt or something or her waistband and had to move her up, but I don't know this specifics exactly. And were you told about that prior to writing your report? 
Um, I believe the movement was after, the specifics of how she was moved was after I wrote the report. And, and then subsequently she was moved from the roadway into the emergency medical vehicle? Correct. And, and do you know how that was affected? I don't know specifically. I know how they typically will move people, but I don't know specifically in this case. No. And after her, Barbara Kenhammer arrived at, at the hospital, uh, do you know what happened to her bo body between the time that she was in the emergency medical vehicle and the time that she was finally placed into a bed? I mean, I, I can get a general sense of what happened to her based on reading the medical records, but I can't specifically give a play pipe play-by-play play of everything that happened. I understand. And, and at each of these movements, uh, there is the opportunity, is there not, for the, the body to incur a, a, a scrape or a contusion? That is a possibility, yes. Then she was in the hospital uh, in the intensive care unit, correct? Yes, sir. And, and there they performed quite a number of medical procedures. Yes, sir. And you, you reviewed those medical procedures. <laughs> I'm showing you Exhibit 9. Yes, sir. About which you testify, correct? Yes, you are. And if I understood correctly, what you were saying with respect to Exhibit 9 is that you did your very best on Exhibit 9 to document those injuries to Ms. Mrs. Ken Hammer's body that you could attribute to a reasonable degree of medical certainty to medical procedures which had been performed upon her. Correct. Injuries, although injuries, not everything on here is an injury. I would say some of them are evidence of procedures, not injuries. But I tried to put on this diagram everything that I thought could be incurred in the hospital as part of that. Right, and I misspoke because this includes, for example, the fact that uh, her organs were donated. Yes, sir. And, and, and that included skin and eyes and other organs from her body. Is that correct? Yes, and bones as well. Okay. There were other injuries, marks on her body, which you could not attribute to a reasonable degree of medical certainty to medical procedures which have been performed on her, correct? Correct. Here I'm going to place in front of you Exhibit 7. Can you see this okay? Yes. At the conclusion of your examination, you concluded that Mrs. Ken Hammer had suffered uh, blunt force trauma to the head, the neck, the torso, and extremities. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm really keen on getting nomenclature correct because I'm not a physician. Okay. When you use the term blunt force trauma, what do you mean by that? So blunt force trauma is simply an injury to portion of the body that is brought about by a, either the body being struck by a blunt object or the body striking a blunt object. Okay. Um, And it doesn't always mean it's like a baseball bat. Correct. It, it could be something very simple like a stone, is that correct? Yes, sir. Or a shard of glass, for example. Shard of glass may actually produce sharp force injuries, which are different than blunt force injuries. Uh, so we differentiate between sharp force injury and blunt force injuries. Yes. Now, there's another part of the nomenclature I need to understand. During your testimony on direct, you talked about opinions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, with which we're always concerned in the courtroom, and you understand that term. I understand it, what I know it to mean. I know that there's not necessarily a definitively widely accepted definition. 
But that is different than you're saying something is consistent, correct? Yes, sir. When you say something is consistent, it means that you may not know to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, but that something is possible, correct? Correct. So when you talk about consistent, you're saying it's possible as opposed to it's probable, correct? Um, consistent could also mean probable for me as well. So um, when we talk today, here's what I'd like to do so that we're all operating with the same terms. We have opinions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, and then we have that which is possible and that which is probable. Is, is that fair? I believe so. Okay. I've got to tell you, in the law, we use the term a reasonable degree of medical probability and a reasonable degree of medical certainty as synonymous. Okay? Yes, sir. I'm not real good with a laser pointer. You described this injury, I believe, as a three and one half inch red pink contusion linear, correct? Yes, sir. To a reasonable degree of medical certainty, what caused that? <coughs> To a reasonable degree of medical certainty that it was caused by a blunt impact injury. And to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, can you state what was the cause of the blunt impact injury? The mechanism, you the mean? The mechanism. No, I cannot. Red brown. Red brown, superficial, V shaped abrasion. I think U shaped abrasion. U shaped abrasion. To a reasonable degree of medical certainty, what is the cause of that? Again, it is a blunt impact injury, but I cannot definitively tell you the exact mechanism in which that was formed. The <clears throat> three and one quarter inch. Cluster red purple contusion on the right inner arm. And similarly, the four by two and a half inch patchy purple. Purple red, I believe. Purple red. I'm sorry. I'm getting glare, so I can't read very well right there. One moment. Here, I, I can show you. Four by two and one half inch patchy purple red irregular to round contusions. Okay. And this is on the inside of the left arm, is that correct? Yes, sir. To a reasonable degree of medical certainty, what is the cause of those? Again, these are blunt impact injuries on the upper inner arms. I cannot, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, tell you exactly how they were formed. Are they consistent with someone reaching under her arms and moving her? They could be consistent with that, yes, with grabbing of the arm. Right. They could be consistent. So what we're saying is that's possible, but we can't say for sure. I even say it may be probable here, given the pattern of injuries, but I can't say to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that that is exactly how that injury formed. and the front of her legs below the knees. You, you talked about several contusions and I believe some abrasions, is that correct? Yes, sir. To a reasonable degree of medical certainty, do you know the cause of these? Again, they are blunt impact injuries to the tissue. Do you know, know the mechanism by which they were created? I cannot specifically tell you how that injury occurred, no. Would the injuries to her, the backs of her calves, be consistent with being yanked out of an automobile that was 
tipped on an incline? It, possibly. I, I, I don't know. Right. It's possible. Correct? Correct. With respect to any of these contusions, do you know the mechanism by which they were created? Regarding the contusions? To a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Again, I can say that they are blunt impact injuries, but I can't say the exact mechanism, no. Might the one and a half by three quarter inch red contusion on the right upper buttocks have been caused by, say, being laid on a stone or having been turned onto a stone? It's possible. I have placed in front of you exhibit number six. Can you see this all right? Yes, I can. Can everybody see this? At the time that you performed the aut autopsy and wrote your report reaching conclusions, have you been given any information about the nature of Mrs. Kendhammer's work? I don't believe so. On, on the prior exhibit that I showed you, are you able to say to a reasonable degree of medical certainty about when those contusions and abrasions which you noted had, had occurred? I can say that they appear to be recent, but I can't go into a definitive date or minute or hour or anything like that. Is that the same with respect to your examination of Mrs. Ken Hammer's hands? Correct. Had you been given information about the nature of Mrs. Ken Hammer's work, is it possible that it could have informed you about the nature of the injuries to her hands? I... You know, I'm going to withdraw that. That's an unfair question. It's so vague. <laughs> Let me, let me represent to you that Mrs. Kenhammer worked in the, uh, in a middle school as a cook. Okay. And that she handled 50 pound sacks of flour, sugar, whatever, and also had to place uh, trays or containers, of, metal containers of food into uh, hot water tables. Could that, would that information have been of aid in trying to determine the cause of broken fingernails? I don't think so. And why is that? Because I Again, I'm not saying exactly how her fingernails got broken. What I'm saying is that they are broken. And I, knowing that she works a specific profession wouldn't tell me definitively that she did that to her nails while working that job. This is one of those things where if you knew that, you might say it's consistent, but you could not say to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that that was the mechanism by which her nails were broken. I would say that it is possible to break your nails during all sorts of daily events, including jobs such as her job, but I would not feel strongly that it was probable that that was the case. Right, and, and we spoke previously that when you say something is consistent, you're saying it's just possible, correct? Correct. With respect to the, any of the injuries, or abrasions, contusions, which you noted to her hands, 
do you know to a reasonable degree of medical certainty the mechanism by which they were created? Similar as before, I can say that they're consistent as far as the abrasions and the contusions go, they're consistent with blunt force injuries. I cannot tell you the exact mechanism in which they occurred. The torn nails are, I guess you could call them a blunt force injury as well. It's not an injury to the skin, but a tearing of the tip of the nail. And that would be caused by fingernails scraping against something or getting caught on something. You cut her fingernails. Yes, sir. And, and the purpose of the f cutting the fingernails was to preserve whatever evidence there might be, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, sometimes people scratch others, correct? Yes, sir. And when they do, it is possible for them uh, to leave, to place under their fingernails the flesh of the person they scratched. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that's one of the reasons you cut the fingernails so that you can see whether there was, so that someone later on can test to see whether there was flesh under the fingernails. More specifically, DNA usually, yes. Well, DNA, but also flesh. There's, there's a difference between the two, correct? Um, yes, there is a difference between DNA and flesh. I, I don't know what type of testing they specifically do at the laboratory, the crime laboratory here. Right. So, And the many mechanisms uh, that exist by which one may acquire DNA of somebody else under their fingernails is probably not within your area of expertise, correct? Well, I can say that there are many different scenarios where it may occur, but I'm not specifically an expert on DNA analysis. One could simply shake hands, is that correct? That may be possible. I'm honestly not sure. in front of you exhibit number eight. You can see that okay? For the most part, yes. Okay. I want to make sure you see it. It's just getting glare on the upper right-hand corner, but I think I'll be okay. Madam Clerk, might we dim the lights back here? Better? Much better, thank you. At the conclusion of your examination, you wrote a report, and it was the conclusion of your report that a single impact from a pipe, with or without subsequent breaking and possible whiplash type injury, could not account for the multitude of injuries. Is that correct? That is correct. Is it fair to say that that statement makes an assumption that there was a single impact from the pipe? That is how I wrote the statement, yes. Did you assume that at the moment of impact, Mrs. Kendhammer was stationary? No, I did not assume that. In fact, an automobile is a dynamic environment, correct? Correct. You're sitting down here but have been animated, correct? Yes, sir. You're sitting down but have turned your head many times, correct? Yes. And in this instance, Mr. Kenhammer alleged that a pipe 
what turned out to be a pipe, an object came toward his car and came through the windshield, sufficient velocity and force to break the windshield and come into the automobile and strike his wife, correct? Correct. And if her head were moving <coughs> at the time of the pipe coming through, the pipe had the potential, because it is some five feet long, to strike her head in more than one place. Is that correct? That may be possible, yes. When you were testifying on direct, you said there was a palpable nasal fracture, correct? Yes, sir. And I think you said that you felt her nose and could discern with your fingers the fracture, correct? I could feel some crepitus. I also saw the imaging studies that showed that there was a fracture in hospital as well. The raccoon eyes, about which you mentioned during your direct testimony, seem to be depicted on Exhibit A. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So tell me again, not again, please tell me whether those raccoon eyes relate to the nasal fracture. The raccoon eyes may very well relate to the nasal fracture. They could also relate to that laceration on her forehead because, again, when you have blood collecting under the skin, it is also affected by gravity. And if there's loose tissue planes, the blood will seep down into recessed areas, such as around the eyes. And presuming that at the hospital she was laying in a bed, would that explain some of the other pooling of blood that you saw? The only other pooling of blood that I thought may be related to that would be on the sides of the eyes. Um, the on exhibit A, it would be here and here. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Your Honor, we have marked as exhibits exhibits 201 through 204, and I believe uh, we have s the prosecution and I have stipulated to their admissibility, and on that basis, I would move their admission. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Those uh, four exhibits will be received. You wish to publish them? Yes, sir. Any objection? No. Madam Clerk, may I switch over to this device? <laughs> <laughs> are not necessarily the best resolution, but can you see this? Yes, sir. Does this, do you recognize this as depicting Mrs. Ken Hammer? Yes, I do. And in the photograph, do we see what you and I have been referring to as raccoon eyes? Yes, sir. Do we also see that sutured injury on her forehead? Yes. And You mean that mark or that mark? That mark. Okay. Do you know what that is? It looks to be cutaneous hemorrhage or bleeding in the skin. Do you know? Do you know to a reasonable degree of medical certainty the mechanism by which that mark was made? 
Not specifically, no. Do you know to a reasonable degree of medical certainty whether it is related to the fracture of her nose? I feel it's likely related to the fracture of her nose, but I can't 100% say so, no. Okay. previously shown you and marked as Exhibit 62. This was the contusion to the lower lip about which you were questioned, is that correct? Yes, sir. And, and do you know to a reasonable degree of medical certainty the mechanism which caused this contusion? There was blunt impact injury or blunt forces applied to the mouth area. But do you know the mechanism? I can't state the specific mechanism, no. Right, and so when you were questioned about whether this could have been caused by pressure on the lower lip from a hand, I believe you said that was, uh, it, it was consistent with that, is that correct? It would, yes, which by that I meant it was a po possible, yes. It's possible. But it's also possible that it was caused by something else. Is that correct? Correct. Similarly, there was a contusion to the upper lip. Is that correct? Yes, sir. There we go. And we, we see that here. Exhibit, thank you. Exhibit number 62. Do you know the mechanism by which this contusion was created? Again, I can only say that it's blunt force injury. I cannot state the specific mechanism in which it occurred. And it's possible that it could have been created by pressure by a hand, but it's also possible it could have been created by something else. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Hill, I don't know if I heard it wrong or not. Uh, the first one was 63. This is 62, correct? Correct. Just for the record, in case I heard 62 twice. So I don't I, know if I did or not. No, you, you well might have, Judge. Well, I just want to make sure you got the record straight, so go on. Thank you. I appreciate that. Madam Clerk, may I switch back once again? I'm going to show you what's been marked and admitted as Exhibit 203. Now, when you saw the photographs of the interior of the car, did you see the mug or cup that was on the floor of the car? I don't recall at the time seeing the mug. I did eventually see pictures of the mug prior to today, but not before my report. And, and when were you shown those pictures? Um, I think a few months ago, maybe. And here you notice the measured indentation in uh, the blue portion of the cup. You see that? I see that, yes, it appears that there's a defect on the edge of that blue portion. To show you what's been marked is admitted 202. is exhibit 203 in relation to exhibit 201. Is it possible that during the accident Mrs. Tendhammer Mrs. Kenhammer's face was forced against the cup with the cup, the blue portion, breaking against the bridge of her nose, causing this semicircular mark, and the bottom portion of the cup, which you see is beveled in two places,
cause her any injuries to the inside of her lips. Looking at those isolated injuries, then yes, it could be, it's a possibility, not en encompassing all the, the other injuries seen. I understand. Yes, sir. What we would call a scratch. Yes. Is it possible that those abrasions were caused by shards of glass? I don't believe those abrasions were caused by shards of glass hitting her neck. No, I feel that is inconsistent. But if she had shards of glass on her neck, and she had to be rested out of the car against her husband, who might have been holding her in a bear hug, and they fell backwards, that had the potential to press those shards of glass into the flesh. Is that correct? It would have that potential. However, the injuries are very high on the neck, including underneath sort of the fold right here, and there's a, quite a large number of abrasions that I feel would be inconsistent with that scenario. Madam Clerk, may I turn on the... I'm going to have to move this so that the other's not in the jury's way. Again, the resolution here isn't good, but you said you had been provided with pictures of Mr. Ken Ham. Is that correct? Yes, I had. And I'm going to hand you a copy of Exhibit 204, which we are showing on the screen. Thank you. Those abrasions are similar in nature to those that you found on Mrs. Ken Hammer, are they not? Well, they are similar in that they are linear abrasions on the neck. There's fewer of them here than on Mrs. Sure, Ken Hammer. There. And if Mrs. Ken Hammer or Mr. Ken Hammer had shards of glass on their on on either or both of their necks. And she was grasped in a bear hug where they were neck to neck. The glass could have pressed into both of their skin. Is that correct? Yes, that could occur. But again, I feel that the number of abrasions on Ms. Ken Hammer's neck are not consistent with that mechanism. Also, the fact that the injuries are very limited in scope to the front part of her neck there. And That's if, correct. They are. Were you given information at the time that you conducted your examination that after having been struck by the pipe, Miss, Mrs. Kenhammer was flailing about? I believe I might have been told that at the time, if not shortly thereafter, yes. And were you given any detail about the manner in which she was flailing about? No, just flailing. It wasn't specific recreation of what was happening, no. And so you don't know whether in the course of flailing about uh, she came into contact with shards of glass. Is that correct? I don't specifically know that, no. You note in the bottom right hand uh, configuration of her head, which would be showing the left profile, correct? If I describe that correctly? Um, sorry, you said the bottom right the hand? The bottom right hand of the exhibit, which would be Mrs. Ken Hammer's left profile? Correct. You note. Uh, one quarter by one quarter purple blue contusion. Correct? Yes, sir. And on the other side of her face, that would be in the bottom left hand corner, a two and seven eighths 
cluster of superficial brown dry linear abrasions. Is that correct? Yes, there was a, I think there was a similar cluster on the left side as well. Right, and so is this what, I just want to be sure, is this what you attributed to possibly having occurred from uh, intubation? There were on the right cheek. Can you use the pointer yep, so I'm I know where you're? Sorry, it was not functioning for a second. On the right cheek, there were a few linear abrasions that were roughly in line with the strap that went around her head. So, as I said, I cannot rule out that some of those abrasions that strap pressing against her skin. However, there were other abrasions there that wouldn't be consistent with that mechanism. And were those other abrasions consistent with shards of glass being pressed against her skin? If you had shards of glass and your face was pressed in and against it, you could form linear abrasions, yes. Were you informed that at the scene, Mr. Kenhammer engaged in CPR? Yes, I was. And did you understand that CPR to be chest compressions? I assumed, I guess, because that's what CPR generally entails, yes. And subsequently, the EMTs also gave chest compressions, is that correct? Yes, I believe she received a round of CPR and then got a pulse back. And, and did they also use paddles on her? I don't recall. Okay. If they had used paddles, could you explain briefly to the jury what we mean by that? Do you mean a defibrillator when you yes. say paddles? So some, in some situations, when someone doesn't have a proper heartbeat or rhythm, um, then they will use a defibrillator. And they have automatic external defibrillators that can sense someone's rhythm and see what their heartbeat is at. And depending on what they detect, it may give a charge to try to jump start the heart. Um, so that is what I mean by paddles or defibrillators. When one gives chest compressions, what is one doing? You are placing significant pressure, downward pressure on the chest. Basically, you're attempting to manually keep that heart beating to keep blood flow going to the organs of the body. I'm going to represent to you that yesterday we heard the 911 uh, medical person talking to Mr. Ken Hammer over the phone and telling him, you go down two inches. Is, is that what you meant by significant pressure? I honestly don't know what is recommended today by CPR measures, um, but you do have to go down. Yes, you want significant downward motion in order to keep that heart pumping. So the object of it is to keep the heart pumping, correct? Correct. And when the heart pumps and there is an injury, it will pump blood out of the body through the injury. Is that correct? It usually will, depends on the injury. When one gives chest compressions, does that have the potential to fracture ribs? Yes, it does. And in this case, did you note whether any of Mrs. Kenhammer's ribs were fractured? Yes, there, there were rib fractures. And were those fractures, well, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, do you know the mechanism by which those fractures occurred? Similarly, I can say that the fractures occurred due to blunt force trauma. And were the fractures consistent with having given uh, chest compressions? In this case, because of the location of the fractures, I would say it's possible, even probable, that the rib fractures were due to CPR, yes. My boss reminds me of questions I didn't ask. I want to talk to you about the cricoid fracture. Yes, sir. And I want to talk to you about that in relation to the representation that after she was struck, Mrs. Kenhammer was flailing about. Uh, the cri cricoid fracture can be a source, well, let me, let's get our nomenclature right. Two things, there's hypoxia and anoxia. 
Can you explain to the jury what each is and how they're different? Okay, so hypoxia is a state of not having adequate oxygen in your blood to deliver to the tissues. And there's a number of ways it can come about. Anoxia basically means that there's no ongoing respiration or, or there's no ability to get oxygen to the tissues. So it's hypoxia is inadequate, anoxia is more severe, that's when you're just not getting oxygen to the tissues. Was the injury to her cricoid, what do we call it, a cricoid? Cricoid cartilage. Cartilage. Was the injury to the cricoid cartilage, uh, is, is that, does that relate to the potential for hypoxia? It may contribute to hypoxia, yes. Were there other injuries that Mrs. Kenhammer suffered that could contribute to hypoxia? Yes. What are those? That would be the head injury with the skull fractures. Because any time you have a skull fracture like that, that suggests that there was significant force applied to the brain tissue as well. And that can cause problems with the brain being able to function to uh, regulate breathing and heart rate and things like that, and therefore not be able to get the oxygenated blood to the tissues as it needs to. Were those, if those injuries had the potential to cause hypoxia, uh, did the hypoxia in turn have the potential to cause her to flail about? Do you, are you suggesting that hypoxia can cause, or brain injuries can cause seizures? You tell me, can they? Well, yes. If you have damage to the brain, whether it be hypoxic damage or direct trauma to the brain tissue, that can lead to seizure activity. And was there direct trauma to the brain tissue in this case? Yes, there was. And what was the extent of that trauma? So the brain was swollen and edematous, meaning that there was fluid retained in the brain. There was bleeding on the surface of the brain called the subarachnoid layer. And there was a small amount of bleeding in the subdural layer, which is between the brain and a covering over the brain. Um, but in addition, there are injuries that can happen to the brain that are harder to see visibly that are simply related to concussive effect from that impact to the back of the head that caused the skull fracture. Additionally, she suffered spinal injury, did she not? She had, in the hospital, they did uh, imaging studies of her cerebral spine, or excuse me, her cervical spine. And that showed that there were widening in some of the joints. And these injuries can be seen in cases of hyperextension where your neck is sort of forced backwards or you come into something and that causes your neck to be forced backwards. So that did suggest that there was some injuries to the spine. I did not find focal injuries in the spinal cord or fractures in the spine, but there was hemorrhaging in the muscle on the back of the neck as well. And would such injuries be consistent with whiplash? Yes, if you want to call it whiplash, but really what more medically we would call it hyperextension injury, where you have kind of back and forth inertial movement of the head. Do you know whether at the scene a C collar was placed on Mrs. Kenhammer's neck? I do, yes, a C collar was placed. And if glass shards had been on her neck and the C collar was placed over it, that C collar had the potential to press those shards into her neck, is that correct? If there were glass shards there, I believe there was a statement that there weren't glass shards seen on the neck. Uh, whose statement was that? Um, I believe it might have been emergency medical services. Do you know who in a medical... I, I can't give a name, no. The other part of that, though, is the C collar doesn't always press tightly against the neck. It presses very tightly against the underside of the chin to kind of keep everything in traction. So it depends exactly. If there were glass there, it would depend where the glass was and how that C collar fit her. So it's possible. Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. Possible, yes.
think those are all the questions I have. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Ms. Domsky, do you have any redirect? Yes, I do. Is it lengthy or? It's not short. Well, why don't we take another short break right now just so we don't get you here too long. We'll take about a 10 minute break or so. Uh, don't talk about the case. And we'll have you back here in a short bit. At the record could show we're back inside the courtroom outside the presence of the jury, a couple housekeeping things. Um, I don't think Exhibit 1 or 200 have been offered yet. Both the opening PowerPoints is your intent to offer those? Well, Your Honor, I, um, I don't think it's something that needs to go into evidence or go back to the jury. I just give that in case uh, if he has a question on what was shown during the PowerPoint. Well, okay. I think everything should be um, received nonetheless, just for the record. Uh, obviously, it won't go to the jury. I have no objection to receiving both of them. I, on that basis, no objection. All right, for that, we'll receive those two exhibits. I think everything else is in order. Okay. Again, planning for the lunch break, whereabouts are we? Uh, depending on how long redirect or any recross goes, I think we'll have a better idea then if we should start the next witness or if it'll be too late. Well, so you don't know what time you'll be done, about an hour? I don't think it'll take that long. Uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes of redirect. There may be some juror questions. Okay. I guess I'd like to give them a, a certain time given what they've been asked. Do you want me just to say we'll break it right around noon? Um, With wherever you're at on your witness, well, I'll give or take a few minutes. Yes. I, I think um, it would be safe to say we could just end at 11.30, aim for that for lunch, because I think a redirect recross will take us till then. We'll stop then and then start That's fine. Her. Got that? Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Anything else? No. If you're ready, then you can bring the jury in. Okay. You may all be seated. Thank you. All right. This time, Ms. Domsky, have any redirect of Dr. Covage? McCubbin, I'm sorry. McCubbin. McCubbin. Dr. McCubbin, can you just get into a little bit more about what your experience is in performing autopsies? Um, you said you'd performed 1,500 um, initially. About how many motor vehicle accident autopsies have you performed? I've performed approximately 80, 80 to 90 motor vehicle accident autopsies. And have you performed autopsies involving compressions of the neck? Yes, I have. About how many? I think about five or so. And blunt force trauma autopsies, how many of those have you performed? Approximately 150 to 160 autopsies of people who died related to blunt force trauma. Were some of those homicides? Yes, some of them were. And how about how many were homicides? I think when I counted it was about 12 or so. You had mentioned that you did the autopsy on one day and then did a re-examination of the body the next day. Why did you do that? So no law enforcement was present during that first autopsy and I wanted to go over the findings with law enforcement. Um, so I also like to take photographs sometimes in these cases on, a, on the second day because after autopsy and the blood's fully drained and, and the tissue dries a little bit, sometimes the injuries become a little more apparent in the photographs. So I took additional photographs that second day and went over the findings with uh, Officer Yelley. Is it typical to have a law enforcement officer there on day two? Um, well, often if it was deemed to be suspicious from the start, the law enforcement officer would have been there on day one. Um, in this case, no one arrived. Also, this is a case where um, this was an autopsy that I was performing for an outside county. Um, so we'd have little say in necessarily who attends it. Um, so in this case, after the autopsy and I had my concerns regarding the injuries, we reached out to law enforcement and asked that they come down and have a look at the body with us. What do you mean from an outside county? Can you just clarify that for the jury? Sure. So as I said earlier, I worked for Dane County Medical Examiner's Office. So during the time that I was there, we contracted to perform the investigation and autopsies for all deaths in Dane County, Rock County, and then actually had also added on Door, Brown, and Oconto counties. Um, but sometimes we had cases uh, from other counties that were of a coroner jurisdiction with, where they would ask us to perform the autopsy on those cases. And this was such a case from La Crosse. 
So you said, and I don't remember your exact words, but that in this case there were concerning injuries, I believe were your words, so you asked law enforcement to come back for day two. Yes. Is that accurate? Correct. There was also a lot of talk about a reasonable degree of medical certainty versus consistent or inconsistent even. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on those terms? Well, as I said before, uh, consistent, if I say that something is consistent with a proposed mechanism of injury, then that means to me that the findings would fit, like that's what I would expect if that was the mechanism. Now, sometimes I can see something and I can say that this is very likely improbable, you know, even more so than consistent. Sometimes I can say, well, it's consistent, but there are other options out there that could have caused this. And then sometimes I see injuries that will then have a proposed mechanism of, of how it occurred, and I say, well, that's not consistent. Like, I would not expect to see those findings if that was how it occurred. And to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, what specifically does that mean? There is not a definite definition of that across all medical examiner systems. However, to me, what I was taught and the way I interpret it is that I – to basically the same sort of premise as reasonable doubt. If I, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Sustain. Can you give the definition without using any legal terms? Sure. So basically I have to have no reason to believe that there is another way that could have led to that outcome. Thank you. When Mr. Hurley was up here, he talked a lot about possibility. And is it your job as a forensic pathologist to talk about or give possibilities, or is your job more involved in that? Is there science involved? I'm not sure I'm following your question exactly. When you do autopsies and you write an autopsy report, are you listing all the possibilities that you think are, are possible, or is there a higher level of science involved when you give an opinion? Sure, so when I do an autopsy report, the first thing I do is I, I list everything that I see. So that's sort of black and white, what I can see and I document it. But then the second part of that is encompassing all that I know about the circumstances of that scenario and determining whether these injuries are consistent with a proposed mechanism or not. So that would, in a sense, be a higher level process in taking all of my experience and the prior cases I've seen and the reading I've done and my training and saying, does this injury fit with what is being told to me about how that injury occurred? Thank you. You were asked if things could be consistent with uh, pulling, yanking her out of the car or moving her from place to place. Um, could some of her injuries also be consistent with a beating? Yes, sir. In some of her injuries certainly could be consistent with an assault or beating as well, yes. Consistent with blood force trauma from a fist? Yes. Consistent with strangulation? It could be, yes. Specifically the injuries to her hands, would you classify those at all as defensive wounds? I personally don't use the term defensive wounds, but those injuries on the hands could be consistent with someone who was using their hands in a way to defend themselves, yes. And the abrasions, uh, multiple abrasions to the neck, uh, would you say that it's possible that those come from fingernails? And in what manner would you, if it's true, in what manner would that be? It's certainly possible that they could come from fingernail scratches. Um, there's a couple different ways those fingernail scratches could form. One is an assailant could scratch at the neck depending on how, uh, how the assault is occurring. Um, but also very consistently described in some cases of strangulation are fingernail scratches that actually are there from the, the victim. Because when you have something around your neck, um, uh, your response is going to be to try to get it away from your neck. So if you're grabbing and clawing at something, you can then scratch and cause these linear parallel patterns of scratches on the neck. So is the pattern and overall accumulation of injuries on a body important to you? Yes, it is. 
Is it helpful to analyze each individual injury in isolation, or do you look at them in totality? Well, you can look at everything in isolation, but you absolutely must interpret everything in totality to say, do all of these injuries, every injury encompassed, is that explained by the proposed mechanism? And you also gave the opinion in your autopsy report that a pipe could not cause all these injuries. Could you explain that? Sure. So the first thing there is that I, not, I did not see and any impact site on the body to me that had a pathognomonic curvilinear injury aspect, such as what you would expect to see if a pipe was coming through at a high rate of speed and impacting the body. Um, also, I didn't see, in places where there were injuries, for instance, like the nose, the mouth, the neck, if a pipe had caused those injuries, I would expect there would have been much more devastating injuries because, again, this missile of sorts is coming at a high rate of speed and would likely be causing more significant fractures and things like that. Um, so I think, I don't know if that answers your question. It does, thank you. Uh, Ms. Dobbs, can I have a little hard time here? Hold the mic down a little bit towards you. Thank you. You're welcome. You also said when Mr. Hurley asked that a pipe coming through a windshield could possibly cause more than one injury. Would you say that's probable? I think that depends on the exact scenario, but I think that if a pipe comes through a windshield, yes, there is a possibility that it first strikes the body and then there could be some rebound and cause some additional injury. I, I, I can't say to a reasonable degree of medical certainty I think it's possible. It might even be probable that there might be more than one injury. And again, would you expect this type of injury with a pipe coming through a windshield for the type of injuries that you saw, the lacerations to the back of the head specifically? The lacerations to the back of the head, while a laceration in a skull fracture in and of itself in isolation could be caused by a pipe, I felt that this laceration was not... There, there's three lacerations on the back of the head, and I don't see that as being consistent with the pipe striking the back of the head. We also looked at photographs with an injury to the bridge of Mrs. Kenhammer's nose, her na nasal fracture, and her lips. And I believe you said it was possible that she could have sustained those three injuries from being struck with the mug. I think he was. they were specifically referring to the nasal fractures, yes, on the bridge of the nose and the bruising on the lips, yes. The striking of the mug, could that happen as a result of another person striking Ms. Kendhammer with that mug? It's, yeah, that's possible. And with those injuries in the linear fashion on her face, um, if we attribute them to the mug, how does that relate to the cricoid fracture? I don't see a scenario where the cricoid fracture could be caused in the same blow, blow from that mug, if we're assuming that those injuries on the front of the face were caused by a mug. Because if we're assuming that, then that was suggesting that the mug was raised up where the curvilinear portion hit the nose and then you had the mouth injuries. The cricoid cartilage is actually very protected in some ways because the mandible or the bottom jaw acts as sort of a shield. So if you have a mug up here, then I don't see how that could cause a cricoid cartilage fracture in the same impact. Thank you. There's also a lot of talk about shards of glass. Are you familiar with windshield glass? Yes, I am. And can you just tell us what you know about windshield glass? Well, so in general, uh, in newer in recent cars, not necessarily old, old cars, um, the front windshield is laminated glass. Um, so there is a layer, and I don't know the specific makeups of this because I'm not a, a glass expert, but basically... Well, I'll be sustained. Um, I guess you can ask some other questions about it, but... The defense just asked a lot of questions about the glass. I understand. You can ask something else. Go ahead. So have you seen injuries from windshields in your work as a forensic pathologist? Yes, I have. And um, are there typical, in those injuries, do you see shards of glass? Yes. And were the injuries that you saw to Barb Kandhammer um, 
probable for shards of glass causing those injuries from the windshield? I have never seen that pattern of injury in any of the motor vehicle accidents that I, autopsies that I've performed. So I would not say that they're probable, no. The cricoid fracture that we talked about on the neck, um, what does typically cause or are possibilities for causing the cricoid fracture? So a cricoid fracture um, can be caused by blunt impact injuries to the neck right over where the cricoid is. And actually, it used to be more common in motor vehicle accidents when you didn't have the three-point restraints because someone may get pushed forward, neck outstretched, and hit the dash. It's less common now, in, now that we have three-point seat belt restraints. Um, but you can get, if you have a chop to the neck or something strikes the neck right over the cartilage, that can cause a cricoid cartilage fracture. Alternatively, it's been described in sporting events, for instance, if someone takes a hockey puck or something straight to the neck, or in cases of compression of neck with manual strangulation, where intense pressure is placed over the cricoid cartilage and causes it to fracture. We also looked at some photographs um, of the injury to Barb's cheeks and neck, and then also to Todd's uh, neck and cheeks. Would you say that both of the injuries on Barb Kendhammer and Todd Kendhammer, those specific injuries would be consistent with fingernails? It, it could be, yes. And in fact, I think in Mrs. K I can't say for sure with Mr. Kendhammer, but Mrs. Kendhammer, I, I think that it's even possibly probable. It's, I, I can't think of another mechanism that would cause that injury on the neck. I know you didn't examine Mr. Ken Hammer, but we did look at that photograph. From what you saw in that photograph and what you saw with Mrs. Ken Hammer, were there injuries similar to the neck? Um, they were different because Mrs. Ken Hammer had quite a lot of abrasions on the neck, and this is again from the limited photographs I saw of Mr. Ken Hammer. Um, and then she also had areas of bruising on the neck, and then of course obviously the internal trauma in the neck. There was some discussion about the spray of glass possibly causing injuries. Um, do you think that that's probable? No, I do not. I think that a spray of glass Objection would... Objection competence. Sustained. You previously testified that I believe you thought that was possible, that a spray of glass could cause some of these injuries. Is that correct? Not exactly. C can you restate your testimony? I believe I said that I didn't think the spray in and of itself of glass would cause these injuries, but that if there was glass deposited on the skin and there was rubbing of the glass over the skin, that that could cause some similar appearing injuries. If a spray of glass were to cause injuries, what type of injuries would you expect? That's a difficult question to answer because it all depends on the force with which the, the glass was sprayed. What I can say is that in injury, in, in autopsies that I've done of motor vehicle accidents, when the windshield has been broken, I have not seen that sort of injury. Obviously, if someone gets impaled on a piece of glass, that's going to cause a different type of injury than the injuries we see here. In your autopsy report, you also state, and the defense um, brought this up when they were questioning you, it is your opinion that a single impact from a pipe with or without subsequent breaking and possible whiplash type injury could not account for the multitude of injuries. Can you tell me why that's your opinion? So that's my opinion because for a couple different reasons. The first one is looking at the totality of the injuries, looking at the injuries on multiple sides of the head. The three lacerations on the back of the head is particularly concerning to me because I don't feel that that's likely consistent with the pipe striking the back of the head. And then you have multiple injuries on the front of the head. And then in and of itself, there are certain injuries that raise a high level of suspicion for me. And those would be in combination, the abrasions on the neck and the fracture of the cricoid cartilage. Because I don't see an alternative mechanism that I feel would be consistent with causing that injury in this scenario. You also discussed with Mr. Hurley about Barb Kenhammer's rib fractures and whether those could come from CPR. Yes. Would you have any way to tell whether that was CPR performed by Mr. Kenhammer or by the paramedics? No, I would not. 
Have you seen seizure activity before? Yes, I have. And have you seen seizure activity result in the flailing that would cause these type of injuries that Rep. Kendammer suffered? I have seen injuries related to people having seizures. I have never seen this multitude of injuries and the severity of injuries in relation to someone having seizures. Mr. Hurley also talked to you about the C collar and the glass that might be underneath that C collar. And I believe you said it was possible. Would you say it's probable that that caused those injuries? I would not say that, no. Was there specifically any questions that Mr. Hurley asked you or things that he brought up that would impact your opinion on the cause of death of Barb Kendammer? No, my cause and my cause of death remains the same, um, regardless of any additional information that was brought up today. And are you still of the opinion that the pattern of injuries that was reported by Mr. Ken Hammer is the pattern of injuries is inconsistent with the events related by Mr. Ken Hammer? Yes, I am. For the reasons I stated previously, the multitude of injuries, um, the lack of any impact that I feel is consistent with a pipe impaling her, um, and the concerning injuries on the neck in particular. Thank you. Doctor, did someone tell you that Mr. Kendhammer said all of the injuries to her wife, to his wife, was caused by a pipe? No, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Kenhammer didn't relate that, correct? No. But certainly it wasn't related to you. Um, no, I mean, it, it was stated... Okay. Sorry. What you were presented with was a representation that Mr. Kenhammer said a pipe came through the windshield striking his wife. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I was told. You saw many other injuries that you cannot determine the mechanism by which they were created. Is that correct? Correct. But that doesn't mean that a pipe didn't come through the windshield and strike his wife. Is that correct? I don't see an injury that I feel is consistent with a pipe coming through the windshield. You don't see it, but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Is that correct? I don't you think... objection relevance. Sustained. Doctor, your conclusion, as I understand it, was a single impact from a pipe with or without subsequent breaking and possible whiplash type injury could not account for the multitude of injuries. Yes, sir. That is the conclusion that you reached after the examination, correct? Yes, sir. And you gave testimony today that there were many injuries for which you could not state to a reasonable degree of medical certainty the mechanism by which they were created. Is that correct? That is correct. And both the prosecution and the defense discussed with you many possibilities for the creation of those injuries. Is that correct? That is correct. And at the end of the day, nothing has changed. You still cannot tell this jury to a reasonable degree of medical certainty how those other injuries were created. Is that correct? Correct. And while you have performed autopsies on a, a, a number of people who have died as a result of automobile accidents, uh, you have never performed an autopsy on someone where the claimed mechanism for death was a pipe coming through the windshield. Is that correct? That is correct. You are not an expert in glass, correct? Correct. And as we discussed before, not in engineering or physics or biomechanics or accident reconstruction. Is that correct? That is correct. You said the scratches on Todd Kenhammer could be consistent with fingernails. 
and that it was possibly probable. And I don't understand those terms. So. I don't recall exactly what I said as far as, I think, possible. I said in Mrs. Ken Hammer, I thought it was probable. Were you provided with the results of the examination of the fingernails? Not specifically, no. So you don't know that there was no flesh recovered from the fingernails? I had not, have not received a report on that, no. You said at one point you did not see an alternative mechanism for the injuries to Mrs. Kenhammer. What did you mean by alternative mechanism? Meaning that assuming, if we take a second and assume that a pipe came through the windshield and that she had some whiplash injuries related to subsequent braking and the car going on the side of the road, and even if she flailed a bit from seizure and getting out of the car, I still do not feel that all these injuries are explained by that. Of course. It, it wouldn't explain injuries to the face, correct? And particularly the injuries to the neck. Right. And, and, but you're unable to say how those injuries were created, correct? I cannot specifically tell you the exact mechanism. And we talked about possible ways in which they were created innocently, and the state talked about possible ways in which they were created not so innocently, correct? Yes. And at the end of the day, you don't know, correct? Correct. I can't say the definitive mechanism. And, and so what I want you to be clear about with the jury is what you do know, okay? Okay. Because you're the expert. And your expert opinion at the end of the day was that you didn't believe to a reasonable degree of medical certainty that a single impact from a pipe with or without subsequent breaking and possible whiplash type injury could account for the multitude of injuries. Is that correct? That's correct. No further questions. In your autopsy report on the summary comment page, you say, in summary, the totality of the pathologic findings are inconsistent with the reported accidental mechanism. Do you still hold that opinion today? Yes, I do. Do you hold that opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes, I do. Did it? Ms. Domsky? Is it? Mr. Hurley? Yes. Hey, right. at this time, does any member of the jury have any question? Okay. Uh, we'll give you a clipboard, uh, and you can write your question up to three in that big space at the top. If you need more, um, go to the next sheet. You know, it's just the one juror, right? Oh, you have a question, too? Anyone else? Uh, Council, you can come up here and look at this. Hey, I have um, <clears throat> questions from two jurors. They'll be marked uh, Exhibits 500 and 501. Uh, Dr. McCubbin, um, the juror wants you to define recent when you talked about uh, some hand injuries which appeared to be recent. So can you just define or clarify what you mean by recent? Sure. What I mean by recent is within the last, it could be, you know, hours to days, but I can't say specifically this occurred, you know, one day ago or 18 hours ago. Um, I can simply say that it occurred over the past few days at some point in time. All right. And Exhibit uh, 501 is from another juror. I'll ask one of the questions but not the other. So don't take anything from that. 
Um, this is regarding healing. Uh, did you see any healing consistent with any of the injuries uh, purportedly sustained on September 16th of 2016? Well, there were on the abrasions, for instance, you can see evidence of healing, crusting of the wound, which is caused by inflammatory cells that respond, for instance. Um, uh, of course, that is not unexpected because she was in the hospital. Uh, on the, we maintained on the ventilator for a period of time, so you can have that healing occur while someone's on the ventilator in the hospital. Very well. Anything else? No, Dr. Right. McCubbin? <laughs> Doctor, you uh, may step down. Can she be released from her subpoena? <coughs> yes. I don't believe that's <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll break for the noon recess now for about an hour. Uh, don't talk about the case. Enjoy your lunch, and we'll get you back in here at about 12.30 thereabouts.